Hello everyone, I hope you are doing well, all well. Uh, today we have a special live streaming with uh, Dan. Dan, you know, is the boss of our review. Uh, I would like to welcome also Francois and Thomas who are joining us today. Uh, first, we're gonna know more about Francois and Thomas. Let them talk about themselves, then I will introduce uh, Dan for you. Thomas? Sounds good, do you want to yeah. Okay, then I start. Uh, hello, um, audience. I'm Thomas, uh, living in Germany. Uh, was born in 1975, a damn good year. <laughs> and uh, I started uh, in 1993 uh, buying my first e-wire. I uh, sold newspapers on weekends and uh, restocked uh, the the storage in supermarkets to earn money uh, for the e-wire, which was 350 uh, Deutschmark. Uh, very expensive, but uh, it was a must-have. And in the in the following years, I, I started collecting uh, all the, the old frames, M-frames, eye shade, Mombos, uh, Zeros, and, and such. And after 2000, uh, the, the collection uh, became a, a boost. Uh, with uh, eBay, when when eBay was online, um, I started collecting uh, much much more, and yeah, today there is a little bit. <laughs> so, and I'm I'm happy uh, that I can uh, take part in this uh, this interview, and yeah, I'm prepared. So, Francois, yours. And ho hopefully one day, Thomas, we're gonna see your collection live on the group. We are curious now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I I have to clean up a little bit, but uh, this this behind me is is already tidy. But there there are uh, a lot more cases uh, that need to be cleaned. Amazing, amazing. <laughs> Francois, the famous Francois. In Brazil. Famous or yes. famous? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> um, yeah. So uh, how to start? Um, I'm French. Uh, I'm living in Switzerland. Uh, I'm born. Uh, I was born in nine uh, in eighty two. Sorry. Uh, so um, yeah, and and I started collecting Oakley. Well, I, I bought my first pair in uh, two thousand three, if I'm correct. Yes, it was a, a monster dog that I have here on the table, and I, I might show it later or right now. Oh, nice. the, the Toy toys, toy toys, one brown toy toys, and uh, yeah, it started like that. I was with a buddy uh, who wanted to change his lens uh, on a pair of Oakley. I had no idea what that was, and I just started like that. And the collection is now over a hundred something. Uh, I'm not sure. I lost count at one point. Uh, I used to be really uh, well counting everything, uh, recording everything. Uh, now not not so much anymore. Don't know why. Uh, maybe I lost a little bit of interest, but um, there's just, a site uh, that can help you. <laughs> yeah, I know. I, I think everything is still recorded there. <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, what else? Um, not much. Uh, hi, uh, Oakley Expertise members, and um, and uh, happy to share this uh, this interview. Thank you. you, thank you, thank you, thank you for joining. Uh, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about Dan. So Dan is a longtime Oakley collector who got his first pair in 2002. After that, he bought one more, then one more, and now he has maybe more than 400. Uh, he worked in technology for university, owns a small business, and has many hobbies, including photography, web design, and historical archiving. He created a website for his own purposes, in order to catalog all the old and new Oakley products. But once it was found by others, they were jealous, of course, it quickly became a resource for many Oakley fans to use. Over the past 17 years, the site has been used by customer service, collected thousands of database entries, and resulted in many trips to Oakley headquarters to meet up with other fans. I'm going to tell you something, Dan, because I knew uh, about Oakley from Fabio. He taught me the love of Oakley. Uh, Fabio is the, also the admin of the group. 
And then the first thing, uh, I was trying to search for his collection, the name of the sunglasses. So he told me, if you want to know everything, you should go to Oriview. So I, the first website I checked for Oakley, it was Oriview. And cool. I think I learned a lot of this website. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, it's been a very fun experience uh, over 17 years now. Uh, it actually started about a year earlier um, because I had started a database that was not online. It was just on my computer. So actually, the, the first O review was just uh, local on my computer. It wasn't on the internet. Uh, okay. I just had everything that had been created at the time in 2003. So it was just like plates, scars, uh, X, you know, some X metals, uh, nothing old, just things that were currently available. And I just had it as everything on one page. So you had to scroll, scroll, scroll to see everything. Okay. Um, then what I did is I started working with databases where I could have everything in a database and then have the website just list the content as opposed to just having a, a regular web page. And I put that on my work computer, which was connected to the internet. And it didn't have oreview.com. It just had my works address, uh, a folder, not a very good website address. And basically, uh, someone happened to find it because it was on Google. And they searched for Juliet. They found the website. And then they, uh, I had a review on there because my friends were the only ones who had access to it or knew about it. So they basically. My friends were adding reviews, and then all of a sudden, I saw a review from someone who wasn't my friend. So <laughs> someone on the internet had found it. Uh, his name was Eddie. He's actually still a member. He's uh, he's a review member number two. He's he's still around, and uh, he started adding reviews. We got to talking, and then eventually, more people started finding it. And basically, it was on the search engine. So people are googling Juliet, Sex Metals, whatever. Uh, they were finding the site. They were adding reviews. They were starting to help out. A couple months later, I, I created the member section where you could have a collection. Uh, I created the forum, and uh, then we just started sharing information. We got to see the, the thump before it come out came out. We got to see uh, the hatchet wire, which was the first aluminum model, and uh, it just kept going from there. That was uh, 2004, and then here it is, 2021, <laughs> still going. Good, good. Uh, Thomas, would you like to start with the questions? Uh, yes, uh, let's start with the interview. Um, the first question uh, is coming from Steve Goldberg. And his question is, why didn't Oakley come out with a clear jawbone, jawbone model? Uh, would two of love to see that or an antifreeze? Yeah, so clear models on the sport frame are traditionally tough. We actually didn't have any clear models for quite a while. And I believe, and this is just from my understanding, is that most of the time when you have a clear frame, it's not as uh, durable, it's not as flexible as a, a regular frame. So if you remember the, the Pro M frame, which had no hinges, it was just one solid frame, you could actually take the lens out and stretch the frame into a straight line, it would come back right as is. The clear frames didn't have that flexibility, so we didn't see any clear frames for quite a while. Um, so since the jawbone is technically in the sports line, you just don't see the clear ones or the translucent ones um, as often. Now there were, there have been some like the the crystal uh, half jacket and flat jacket which have come out. So I'm guessing that's probably the reason is that they just uh, the clear frames just don't have the durability as the the regular O matter does. Um, so that's my understanding. I don't have a 100% firm answer on that, but just based on what I've seen in the past, I believe that might be the reason. But it would be cool. I'd love to see an antifreeze job on. I think that would be very nice. Sure. Thanks. Good. The next question will be for uh, from, sorry, RG Smart. Mm, I assume this is for racing jacket smart. <laughs> um, and that's, uh, okay. Is there any evidence to show that Luxottica changed the Omalo formula again in the last several years? Uh, I believe we, we have all heard the Omalo from the early 90s was prone to pressure cracks and was updated later to what we think of as the 2000s matter, Omalo, very durable. Yep. Yeah, so uh, going back with some history, 
Uh, starting in 1994 with the eye jackets, Oakley produced a, a new material called Omatter and had um, some nylon in it. It was sort of a proprietary plastic uh, mixture where they started making most of their frames of them. So before that, we had things like a uh, Zytel with the eye shade, and we had um, Ceruleum with the frog skin. So basically, once we started getting to the 3D printed or the 3D design glasses, like the eye jacket, the trench coat, and things like that, uh, they had this new formula called Omatter. The problem was it was very brittle. So if you had a moon, sometimes the uh, orbital would crack. If you had a top coat or an eye jacket or a trench coat, uh, the stem would often crack, sometimes right where the ear sock is. So from 94 to 1998, we had that formula. In 1999, everything changed. We had the eye jacket went away and became the new eye jacket. Um, the racing jacket became the racing jacket generation two. The wires changed, uh, the frog skin went away. So there was a lot of different things that changed in 1999. But the biggest thing was that they created a new old matter formula, which had a lot more nylon in it. So that's where you got the ability to flex your frame to a greater degree without it breaking. So again, that's where that pro end frame, where you could stretch it out to a straight line and it would end up being uh, perfectly fine. Whereas if you did that even slightly with like a moon or a top coat, it would just pretty much break. Um, I don't know if there's any new formula since 1999, but there is something called re o matter which is basically recycled frames. So if you go and you donate your uh, frame for either one site program or it's just uh, reclaimed because they give you a credit for a new one, what will happen is they will recycle that o matter frame and turn it into a new frame. They'll just melt it down, mix it into the regular o matter formula, and then a new model would be created from it. They claim that there's no difference between the recycled Omatter and the brand new Omatter. So really it's just a way to sort of help um, not have things be bad for the environment, just sort of help recycle everything. Um, I believe also touching again on the OneSite program, if you donate a, pro, um, a pair of glasses to the OneSite and get a discount, um, most of those were then melted down and created into um, you know, prescription glasses for people in countries who needed a little bit more help. So I believe that is what I've heard as far as any sort of new development with Omatter. Um, but the big one was gonna be in 1999 where they had the one that was much more durable. Okay, great. Uh, next question uh, is from Jasper Ostom and Sorensen. Um, some some uh, greetings in advance. Uh, you are, without doubt, one of the people to be most knowledgeable about our beloved brand. Here are some simple questions. How did you start and why? And is there any specific model or type that has a special meaning for you? Okay, so it started in 2002. Um, at this point, I only had very cheap glasses, ones that were from like the, the, the supermarket or from somewhere, you know, maybe five, $10 glasses, things that would get scratched easily, they would break easily, and I didn't really take care of them. My brother actually ended up getting a pair of scars. And I didn't think that was, it didn't seem to make any sense. Why would you pay $175 for a pair of glasses if they were just gonna get scratched or broken or lost? Um, but what happened was since it cost so much, he took care of them. He made sure they didn't get scratched and uh, it, it ended up being something that he took um, pride in. So I decided that uh, I had just gotten out of school at the time and all my money was going towards tuition and towards paying for school and books. And I decided I wanted something nice too. So uh, at the time, the splice had just came out. He was actually a little disappointed because he liked the splice, but it hadn't been, it wasn't released until like a month after he bought the scar. So uh, I went and I picked up a pair and then basically the two of us started with a pair of scars and a pair of splices. And then we started looking online. We got a pair of minutes. Uh, we actually, I think we got our first X metal. And then from there, it just kept going. So uh, all of my friends got into it. Uh, if anyone has looked at the overview many years ago, you remember that someone on the front page had a bunch of glasses on his head. I think he had like 10 pairs of glasses on his head. Uh, that was another one of my friends who took every pair we had owned and put them all on his head at once. And I believe I've seen a few other people mimicking that too. So uh, from there, we just, uh, you know, once the site started and we started talking to people online, then we realized it wasn't just our group of friends who liked Oakley. It was people all around the world who liked it. So then it just kept going on and on and on. So uh, the, I guess the pair that holds the, the most of my heart would be pair number one. If you hold on one second, I'll grab it. So 
So it's going to be the, the splice. It's the ice splice. And this is the pair that sort of kicked it all off. So uh, I still have it, still in good condition. And it's the pair that began everything. So it sort of uh, is a special part. Awesome. <clears throat> May I ask one question about that one pair? Yes. Did it, did the FMG um, ever peeled off or anything? No, the, the FMG was okay. It was the black chrome that had an issue. So um, yeah, so the black chrome, that was really mm -hmm. the one that had the problem. So I, I sort of knew the problem existed. So I made sure I didn't really wear them as much. Uh, the scar that I talked about that my brother had was the black chrome scar and his just ended up delaminating all the coating came off and it looked basically like just a matte black pair. So he was able to send that back and get a replacement. And then he's just, you know, babied it and made sure that it didn't have a problem after that. Yeah. Uh, my friend also did buy one of these and his completely peeled off too. So uh, the ones I've kept, I've tried to keep in good condition. Um, the FMJ Plus and the FMJ 5.56 never have a problem. They seem to be the chrome ones, uh, white chrome and black chrome that have the two issues. Okay, the next question is from Mario, but I think everyone is asking the same question, Mario Reed. Uh, so Dan Toms, uh, would you like to be informed if we have any models on hand that are not listed within your or review database to be added? And I think he has some. Yes, so there's a few things you can do. So on the system, people can actually help out with the database, but there are different levels. Um, if you just browse to the site, you can't do anything because obviously there might be uh, vandalism or people adding things or deleting things without my knowledge. So if you don't have an account, you can't do anything. If you sign up and create an account, um, not only do you have access to track your collection, chat with people, do reviews, things like that, uh, you have the ability to add things. So you can either add a model or you can add a color to an existing model. You also have the ability to edit whatever you have added. So if you add a new model and then add colors, you can still modify those. Um, the only thing you can't do is delete or change something that someone else created. However, if you do think you really want to help out with the site, I can give you extra permissions, which will give you the ability to edit anything. So therefore, if you see something that's missing, or maybe it's already there, but it's missing a picture, or there's some information that needs to be added, I can give you extra permissions, so you can then help me out. So I have a lot of people who actually go in and help out with the system. So that's one way we can do that. So the only person that can delete things is me, but there are other people who can uh, really do that. Uh, the other thing is that in addition to just things in the database, um, there's going to be a lot of maybe articles or research or things that I want to sort of expand upon going forward. So what I'll probably do is maybe I'll identify a collection or something I want to research, and then I'll use the Oakley Expertise Group, and maybe I'll say, hey, let's take a look at the holiday collection, and let's try to find everything that's been released for that collection. We'll gather pictures, gather information, maybe when things were released. And we'll try to build up these articles. So that way, if people ever have a question on that specific collection in the future, we can say, hey, here's the page that has everything you want to know about the holiday collection. I'm mm -hmm. slowly working through all of the, the various collections and releases. So hopefully, we can have everything in one place. Uh, but I think for now, we'll just sort of maybe pick one, and we'll just try to work through them one by one. So I'll definitely have everyone. Um, on the Oakley Expertise Group, I'll, I'll post things from time to time asking for help. But if people do want to help with the database and adding things that are missing, um, you can add things just by creating an account. But if you want to help out further, just let me know, and I can definitely give you those extra permissions. Sure, we can do this project on our group also. It would be Very amazing good. here. The world unites to help. <laughs> yes, indeed. OK, uh, next question is coming from the UK, uh, Paul Jewis. Long-time member um, yes. everywhere uh, is asking, uh, what's the story on the neon green and neon pink Mumbo M-frame? All right, so so I don't know as much about the neon pink, but the neon green has appeared in a few different places. Uh, the main place I saw it was in the Japanese catalog. So um, I don't know if I have it offhand, but. In the Japanese catalog for all the old original M frames, they had all of the colors listed and they had a neon green one, which just uh, didn't have any information. You never saw it online. 
And aside from that one document, we hadn't really seen anything like that. Uh, the only other time I've seen it is I've actually seen it in someone's one person's collection. And then I did see it in the Oakley headquarters museum. So behind the lobby, two stores, there's a museum there. And in mm -hmm. 2005, they had some very basic uh, historical items. And I do have a picture of that them frame sitting there. So there's at least a couple of them hanging around. I believe what it was is just a collar that didn't take off or just didn't either get released to the public. Since there's so few of them, I'm guessing that it wasn't released publicly and maybe just a few internal ones were either really, uh, leaked out or um, you know, taken by employees or something like that. So I don't know the full story on that, uh, but there's very few of them. And they've really only, I've only seen it maybe like two times aside from being in print. Uh, for the pink one, I'm not sure. I haven't seen any uh, much reference about those. Good. Right. Next question then. Uh, and by the way, it's 4 p.m. here, so that, that's completely normal. Yes. Normal. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's from Benjamin Cahoon, uh, and I'm not sure I'm pronouncing that correctly, but uh, have you ever been offered a job with Oakley or ever involved uh, with an Oakley project? I've never been offered a job aside from going to O stores where they say, hey, do you want to work for us? And I would love that, but I'm just afraid I would end up using my entire paycheck just buying more Oakley glasses. So that might not be too good for me in the end. Uh, I have too many as is. Um, as far as collaboration, though, there have been a few instances where they've, um, I think back when the site first started, maybe 2005 or even maybe just late 2004, they did offer to give me some resources for the site, you know, use like a traditional uh, forum software and do the redesign and things like that. And that seemed like a, a good help, but for some reason, I just wanted to remain independent. I wanted to make sure the site was just something I've created. I wanted to have personal control over the site. So they have offered throughout various times to help out, assist in certain ways. I have had people provide some, maybe some, SKU numbers, information about things. So I've had some, some very small help throughout the time. And obviously every time we've gone to headquarters, they've, they've been very generous and very gracious for either giving us a tour or taking us on certain things or tank rides. Uh, Francois probably remembers that fun experience. So uh, we, we've had some, some good times and they've been very generous throughout the years for just helping us out in very small ways and showing their appreciation. So yeah, no jobs yet. Um, I'm happy where I am. I'm at a university right now, so it's it's a good job. So that sort of helps me you know, pay the mortgage and get glasses every so often. So maybe in the future, but for now, I'm happy where I am. Great, good. great information. Uh, I have another uh, question from Paul Jewis. Um, he is interested in the history of the strip lens. What what do you know about the strip lens? So the, I've never found anyone say anything firm or concrete. So what I've heard, and this is just a story, and this could even be the strip lens or the slit lens, I'm not even sure which one, but someone said an athlete had either an M-frame or a blade, which whichever one they turned into, and they, they ground onto the ground to remove much of the lens until it got so small that it just barely touched where the nose was. So if, if anyone wonders what the strip lens is, It is this one here. So if you are knowledgeable about M frames, you realize how small this lens is. And it is, I don't want to put it on because I'm scared about breaking these, but uh, it's obviously very small and it just it doesn't cover much. So why they wanted that, I'm not sure. And I'm not entirely sure if that story is actually true or not, but uh, that's basically what I've heard. I've also heard others just wanted maybe something for if they were cycling, they just basically needed the bare minimum amount of lens. So I wish I had more. I wish I could find more. I've been asking over the years. Uh, a lot of the designers and people have worked for Oakley for a while, and um, I just still don't have a firm answer on what the origin is. So at this point, I've heard that someone just ground down one to show it off, and then they prototyped it and turned it into a release. But that's about all I have to go on, unfortunately. And, uh, that that will remain the legend. Yes, legend. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Okay, uh, that's a question from me, actually. So a very interesting one. Sure. Uh, <laughs> uh, do you have a rough estimation or even an accurate one uh, of the number of hours you spent on uh, a review for the backend stuff, site creation, update, administration, database update, anything? Yeah, so it's, it's hard to... Oh, sorry, it, it froze for a second. Um, it's very hard to estimate, but it, it's gonna be quite substantial. So just to go over some of the things I've done, um, I don't have an amount of hours. I don't even think I would be able to estimate that, but uh, there's a couple things. There's the, the back end work, like you mentioned, and then there's the, the front end work where I have a database, I have the web design, and then I have the database maintenance where you're just adding images, uh, adding information. So. Every so often when Oakley releases a whole wave of new things, usually there's uh, four times throughout the year they have a quarter one, two, three, four uh, release schedule. They'll release you know, a couple frames with many different colors and I'll try to go through and I'll save the images, I'll, I'll crop out the white space, resize them, put them into the database with all the information. Um, I also try to do this as quickly as possible because I do like to make sure I know when each pair was initially released. Um, so basically, uh, Peter Yu has been asking me for release dates recently, and I'm glad I've recorded all those because I was just able to go to the site, look it up, and get that information. So every so often, I have to add plenty of these different models, um, and then usually there's an Asian fit model, and then there's prescription ones. and It gets sort of overwhelming. So that's why I'm very thankful that other people go in and help me out from time to time because it's just a lot of work sometimes to just add so many different ones, times, however many colors there are. Uh, for other maintenance, I had to create a lot of this site myself. And actually, aside from the image uploading script and I think a couple other things, everything you see on the site is all programmed by myself. So I created the database. I wrote all the code to interact with the database, display things on the screen, all the forms where you submit things and you know post comments or whatever. Everything has been created by myself. So it, it's a pretty substantial undertaking. Um, also, all of the, the graphic design and layouts and things like that over all the years has been mine as well. So we are on version number 11. So we've had 10 versions of O-Review before this, each with a different look and a different functionality, um, and even over two different programming languages. A couple of years ago, I moved from ASB to PHP, which is sort of a more modern one, and uh, it sort of functions a little bit better. So uh, I can't even estimate how many hours is, but basically we got web design, we got database uploading, database creation, maintenance, and then even just you know talking with people on the forum because I try to keep it active too because it's always good to talk with other people. Okay, great. <laughs> um, and the next one was oh well, a funny one. Uh, if you had to keep only one. Would that be okay. the beard or the Oakley collection? I know. I've been thinking about that for, for a week now, and it's a hard decision because <laughs> I don't know. That, that's very hard, Francois, to ask this question. Is it forever or can it grow back? Yeah, that's the problem. <laughs> uh, I don't know. I, I'd say I'd have to probably I'd have to go with the collection because it's, it's too, many, too many people have helped me out. Too many people have been very gracious and very helpful for helping me get things that have been very hard to find, uh, especially ones that would be very expensive now, but I've made sure I haven't you know, had to spend too much on them because uh, you know, getting things like X-Metals now. Is it breaking up on my side only? No, it's, sure. a, it's a bad okay. connection, it seems. There's a okay. problem. I didn't know in America okay. they have problems. He's out. He was gonna come back. <laughs> the first thing I checked is because I'm in Lebanon. I thought it's my connection, and then I looked. No, I'm, it's okay for me. I see he's back. <laughs> Sorry, my internet connection just died. Uh, so I was, I was just thanking everyone for you know, helping me out. Um, things like X medals or old vintage pairs are very hard to find now, and if they are found, they're some often very expensive. So. I've had a lot of people mm -hmm. help me out tremendously with helping me collect uh, what I've wanted to collect. And, and in turn, we, we sort of keep a, a tight circle where we help everyone. So 
um, it's more than just glasses. It's more than just uh, wearing them because obviously I don't wear 400 pairs. I wear just a couple of them. So the collection and the people I've met and the friends I've made have been much more important than, than I guess this. <laughs> So I, yeah, I keep the collection at this point because it's part of a, a larger circle than just myself. I guess How long has it been since you had the uh, bear skin for the last time? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, next question is from me. Um, I uh, thought about uh, things in advance and Uh, one of my questions you already answered uh, is the same uh, about uh, missing pictures in the O review and about support from from fans all over the world. Uh, so I think you you mentioned that already. Uh, the other question I have is uh, how did you gather all the Oakley information and stock photos, and have you any help from Oakley directly to or any any permission to use uh, stock photos like like this? So I yeah. can imagine that there is some. Um, Yeah, some uh, lawsuit uh, if you if you can use or if you don't use pictures uh, from them directly. Yeah, I have had some some problems in the past. Um, actually, back when the Romeo 2 was first released, uh, someone posted a picture on the forum of it, and Oakley was not happy. So that was our first taste of the fact that we were getting known well enough that if we released something, it was public and it was it was causing problems. So we took the pictures down. But then they also said, oh, yeah, make sure you take everything else down, too. So we had a database with no pictures. Um, after about mm -hmm. six months, I hadn't heard anything. I put them back. No one said anything. And then we sort of just continued from there. And then um, I'm not proud to say this, but someone else asked if I had permission. I said, oh, yeah, Jim Jim said it was okay. And they said, oh, okay. <laughs> so okay. That, seemed to, that seemed to work uh, for, for a swan probably remember the similar story where we're out uh, taking pictures at three in the morning at headquarters and security comes out. Do you have permission? I said, yeah. Oh, okay. <laughs> so sometimes you can sort of bluff your way through this. Um, but I would then, like, uh, sorry. I would like to know about this trip at 3 a.m. to Oakley headquarters. You and Francois, I think you were together. We actually had, uh, yeah, so before I go back to the original question, for the 10th anniversary, we had people from was it five countries? I think it was uh, America, USA, France, Australia, Canada. So we had uh, a lot of people come and we sort of celebrated our, our 10th anniversary and we got a good tour. We did some uh, questions and answers. We did a trivia contest where uh, I gave out some things. Uh, they brought us to the, the engine room. They gave us a tank ride. We had a lot of fun that time. So we, we decided that, you know, Francois and I are both photographers. So We figured, hey, it's it's middle of the night. It's probably really cool to get the Oakley at night. So we went up and started taking pictures. And I think we were there for about an hour before someone noticed us. Um, I did go back the next year, and I took some extra photos in the morning. And another security guard came out, and he wasn't as friendly. So I, I left. But we had a good hour of taking pictures before anyone came out and asked us to go away. <laughs> um Yeah, so that was a fun trip. So uh, going back to what sort of information I found uh, in any lawsuits. So I have had a few few issues with them asking to not post pictures, but usually they've been okay. But the biggest issue is if you post something that hasn't been released yet, that's where the problem is. So the Romeo 2 was one of those issues. Uh, the, when the Ferrari edition came out, that was another big mm -hmm. one. So there's been a few instances where uh, they haven't been happy about things being released too soon, but... More often than not, usually I see them on like Hypebeast or some other website. So usually I wait till someone else posts it first before I put it on. If I get anything internal, I usually make sure I, I stay, I keep it private until it's ready to be released. Um, as far as finding information, so majority of what I post is just from oakley.com. Um, sometimes the wholesaler sites will have the images. But usually I'll just pull it from a retail site where I can get the images, the information and things like that. For the older stuff, though, I had to do a lot of digging. So I have had things like old uh, product catalogs. Uh, hold on one second. Yeah, the old Zero catalog. <laughs> yeah, the old Zero catalog. I don't know if I have a copy of them here. but yeah, So I have old, old documents like these, which have, uh, let's see if I have it real quick. 
yeah, so things like this. So this is the old uh, goggle program from 1989 to 90, and here's all these SKU numbers from that release. So I use things like that to help populate the information. And that helps me complete a lot of the things that were very old. So I've held, I've had old catalogs, old product releases, old even internal shop order forms, where I've used a lot of that information to just get the, the information. So once I get it into the system, then at least it's in one place. And then I can reference that from then on. Um, I've also gone through like Oakley's uh, annual reports where I've gotten release dates for certain models. So I've dug, dug everywhere. And if it, if it has information, I've tried to dig into it and try to get that into the database to make sure it's in one spot. So public, private, I have had people internally help me out here and there. Um, so it's anywhere there's information, that's where I'm looking to try to make this thing complete. Great. We appreciate your work. <laughs> I appreciate everyone who helps me too. Then I have a question out of the box from here. I didn't say my question before. Uh, for example, uh, sometimes, you know, only they have special edition sunglasses. And it is like, for, for example, 100 page or something like this. And uh, how do you think it's a good idea to, to let people know about this before? Because sometimes we, we miss them. It's very hard. And it's, there's been, when I first started collecting, they didn't have any special editions. It was just standard releases. And then every once in a while, there'd be maybe an old pair that didn't have many. So you could either collect things that came out or hunt down old things. But then I'd say around maybe 2008, 2009, they started specifically creating collector's editions. So it was actually determined to make something with a very low release number so people could go out and collect it. And at that point, sometimes it, it takes a little of the fun out of it because it's fun to sort of track down something that is not uncommon, but if something is created specifically to not be uncommon or to not be common, then it, I don't know, sometimes it takes a little bit of the fun out. So I, I wish, I don't know, I, I have mixed feelings on this because it is fun to have something that not many other people have, but I also like the ability to be able to get it. So, um, if you can go to a store and find something that's uncommon, I like that. But if you have to wait in line or it's only online, uh, it just sort of takes a little bit of fun out for me. So I feel like I'm repeating myself. So I, I would, yeah, I, I like I like things that are unique but not rare, I guess. So if something comes out with a very bizarre color, like the blue camo fat cat. Hmm. This is a very weird pair, but it was not rare. It was not a special edition. It was not a collector's. It was not a small release, but it's something very unique. And I like that. So I was able to just go out to a ski shop and buy this. Um, I like that much more than something that's not too special, but only has a hundred pieces. So I know there's certain people who, and everyone has a different way of collecting. Uh, some people like to get something that's just very rare, very limited. Um, personally, I like the things that, that look a little different. So that's my preference. Okay. Good. I have uh, a bunch of questions from Jason Weir. Jason is uh, always asking so many questions. Yes. Like, uh... <laughs> <laughs> Including weird ones. But that's, yes, that's, yes. Yeah. <laughs> that's part of the game. Um, <laughs> How cool was it to hear Peter Yi um, has used your site to look up information on projects that he created? It was very, very cool. He, he's been in contact with me for a short while because he's been going through and looking at a lot of the items that he's created and getting release dates and information for that. So uh, thankfully, I've been able to record a lot of that information on the site. So I've been able to use that to help him out. Um, I've met with him a few times throughout the years. So back on our 10th anniversary trip, we went to one of the, uh, across the street from headquarters, there was another building and they bought us burgers and talked to us about some certain information. So we had a chance to talk to him um, in that occasion. I also met him back at the co-pilot event in uh, 2009. And it's very cool to, to see someone who has created some of the models that you've been very inspired by and see them in the, you know, in the flesh and be able to talk to them. So uh, it's very humbling that someone who's created such iconic pieces is coming to me for help because I feel like you know I should be going to him for information, but he's coming to me. So I believe everyone sort of helps each other out um, for the best they can with 
try to piece together all the information that may have not been recorded over the years. Uh, when you started the website, did you ever think it would become a Bible of folklore history used world round uh, by collectors? And I think Not you at all. kind yeah. of answered that. <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't. Uh, it, it, was, it was a personal project. Um, obviously, the first one was not even on the internet, so it was just for me. Uh, the first one that was on the internet was for my friends and I, so just a couple different people. And uh, then once people started using it, then at that point, it seemed like it had some, some use to it. So probably why I'd say it wasn't until maybe 2004 or late 2004 when we really got a lot of people online and I heard customer service was using it. So at that point, I felt like this was something that was being used a lot. Um, but initially, no, it was, it was a personal project, uh, first for myself and then for my friends and I, just to sort of use for ourselves. Well, I'm glad people just like because. It. Just because we can see your your son here, your kid yeah. son, uh, I have a question from uh, right. from Fred Baker. Uh, hi, Fred. Um, from from the chat on Facebook, uh, are your kids allowed to go into a display and grab a pair to wear? Uh, he, he has one pair. You want to show your pair? Yeah. Yeah, we can show everyone on the world now. The world is watching. Ready. So he has a, a pair of uh, quarter jackets, <laughs> and my daughter has. Uh, she has a few pair now. So she has the uh, the red tiger or pink tiger radars. Um, she has one of the uh, prism rose gold frog skins, and then she has. Uh, I think it's a forehand uh, neon yellow forehand. So she has a few pairs. So they have their own nice. ones. Um, but, you know, majority of these I don't wear either, so therefore I want to make sure that they're in good condition. It's okay. Yeah, so, sorry, family. Uh, so basically, uh, yeah, they have their own specific pairs that they can wear, so that way, you know, the fragile ones don't get ruined, because there's a lot of irreplaceable <laughs> models here, I'm sure you can imagine that one. <laughs> Can I borrow the zero threes? <laughs> <laughs> well, actually, all their pairs in good condition currently. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Good. Yeah. good <laughs> we, wore, uh, we went snow tubing last winter, so that was fun. I went snow tubing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, back to Jason questions. Um, <laughs> what made you even think that your website uh, was a great idea? And I mean, obviously you were right, but in the beginning, my MySpace was relevant and you outlived it. Yep. Uh, yeah, so uh, we were on MySpace for a short while and uh, I, I, I almost wish MySpace would come back. I feel like people would be wanting just a very simple social media thing now because I mean, Facebook is useful, but I, I, liked, I like how you could design MySpace and make it as ugly as you wanted it to be. Um, but yeah, it, it's been very nice that we've been able to survive. I mean, most websites from 2004 aren't around anymore. There's been a small resurgence for like GeoCities type sites, but they're more homages to the past, not really ones that have continued. So yeah, there's, there's not too many sites that have been around for, you know, since not the beginning of the internet, but going back that far. So I'm, I'm very happy that we've had some staying power. I'm happy that uh, you know, I log in every day and there's still a bunch of people still posting stuff. So um, many thanks to those who have stayed with us throughout the whole time and also the people who still continue to show up each day and do reviews, help me with information, or even just show up in the chat and say hi. So I'm very, very thankful for everyone who has helped keep this alive because if it weren't for all the people who show up, that sort of gives me the motivation to keep going. Uh, if I had a site where I was just updating information and I never really saw any feedback or saw anyone using it and then it would just be very demoralizing and they might not have the ambition to update it as often. So again, thank mm -hmm. for everyone. And thank you for keeping the site alive. <laughs> Will do. Um, what's your personal question from James? Yeah? Uh, 
what the rarest uh, and or most unusual pair you all own on the chat? So I would like to know for you guys and for Dan. For me, it's the OTT blade. Oh, that is a very awesome pair. I wish I had gotten that one. I wish I had gotten the fours, the blade fours, because they were just for mm. sale. When I first started collecting, uh, the, the blade two fours were on the website. You could just buy them for $85. Um, mm -hmm. At the time, I, I was just collecting. I mean, I just started, so I didn't have the ambition to buy more than one pair. Uh, but I wish I had, because that would have been a nice pair to get. So I do have a couple um, models over here if you want me to show them off. And I think uh, Francois and Tomas want to show off a couple of theirs, too. Maybe we could have a show-and-tell session before we continue with questions. Yeah, so of course. I'll, uh, I'll start with... Okay. So I will start with um, the Purple Cloud for, uh, Frog Skins. So there was a Dalmatian. I don't know if you can see that too well. Maybe if I... I don't know. Uh, so there was a Dalmatian, there was a wild berry milk, and there was a blue sky one. But for some reason, these are purple. I've never seen these in a catalog. I haven't seen them referenced anywhere. Um, they do have the gold iridium lenses versus the gray. But most frog skins at the time had gold and uh, gray for both models. So I'm not sure where that came from. I'm not sure if it was a standard release or just a, a test release. I saw it on eBay many years ago, and I just jumped on it. So I'm happy to have it. I'm not a huge fan of frog skins, but when something like that comes along, it's, it's very exciting. Uh, the next one that comes along is the Snow Jungle 4S. So Snow Jungle uh, differs from Snow Camel, where Snow Camel is more just traditionally like a white one, where Snow Jungle has the stripes on it. So most people saw this with the trench coat, but there were a few like the four and the racing jacket, which had that as well. Uh, they all came with VR28 lenses. So it's uh, another weird one where I haven't seen too many of these, but again, I'm happy to have had it. <laughs> another one is the 0.2P prototype. So this one is different than the normal 2P because it actually has the full circular lens as opposed to one that has the flattened edge. So when they went from the frosted one to the polished one, they went from a circle lens to a flattened lens, but these still have the circle, so they hadn't made that transition yet. And in the corner, it actually, I don't, you probably can't see it, but it says uh, prototype. So that's another cool one. Here is a Ducati cut New Zero with matte gray and a ruby lens. And it doesn't look too ruby because at the time ruby was starting to get very uh, orange. Uh, mm -hmm. A lot of people called it fruby because it was like a fire-like ruby. Uh, modern ones starting with, um, like when Ducati came back, they started creating like a much better ruby, but at the time this is about as red as it got. Uh, but it's a cool pair because it's got the this thinner Ducati style lens. Mm -hmm but it's not the Ducati one that they released. Tons of I'm just gonna end on this one. This is a straight jacket, but it is not an Oakley. It's a torch wear. It was made by Oakley, but they took the icon off and they put the torch wear logo on it. And interesting enough, the, I have the box that comes with this and it does come with an Oakley box, but there's no Oakley logo on it. So it's the Oakley box with a torch wear logo Torture logo on the model here and nothing else. So there's no reference to Oakley, but Oakley did create it um, mm -hmm. as sort of a way to, to recycle an old frame because at that point, that's the original straight jacket model. And at this point, the straight jacket two, uh, or sorry, the new straight jacket was out for, or had been out for a long time. So I guess they sort of took an old frame or an old model and just released it to some other company. And this did happen one other time find it. I don't know where it is at the moment, but there was a, a Twitch that was released as uh, something called the Rocket Dog. And this was for 3D televisions. So you, if you want to have a 3D television at home, you could wear this and see everything in 3D. And it was just the Twitch frame, but the icon was taken off and it just said uh, Rocket Dog on it. So I don't know where it is. It's, it's in here somewhere. A couple days later, I'll probably find it. <laughs> so those are a couple ones that uh, I, I find are exciting. Uh, Francois Tomas, anything you want to show off? 
Um, well, I, I don't think I have anything really special, or maybe I have, well, that's quite You have, have that, one, I, I know I, you have one, Francois. You are hiding from us all the time. <laughs> well, no, well, there's the, the Medusa that everybody saw and, and printed on, on their shirts. Uh, <laughs> With your uh, photo. Can I buy it from you? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, I have two. I, I'm not even sure they are limited editions. Uh, I have uh, a pair of. Uh, I, I'm going to grab that. But there is a, a fuel cell uh, that was done for the French uh, special, uh, well, police, police uh, special forces, and one for the. Well, that's kind of a civilian military, or I don't know how to call that, the, um, the Gendarmerie Nationale. <laughs> that's a <laughs> French, uh, that's a uh, kind of police, but from the army, where we have to separate the uh, police in France. Uh, so those are two limited, I'm not sure they are limited, but those are two special editions from, from the, the police in France. I will grab that as uh, as Thomas is uh, showing <laughs> or talking about his special pairs. Yeah. <laughs> I'm I'm not prepared, not really. Um, I surely have a ton of uh, special and weird things, but uh, they are um, stored away, and um, probably I can show them on the on another day. But um, as far as I know, um, I have a couple of. Um, prototypes from the staple collection um the staple collection uh, did a, a lot of frog skins and i have uh, nearly to every um, relief another um another model uh, where they have the colors so um, that's uh, that's to mention and i have a, a jupiter uh, the, uh, which was made by Christian Hundertmark. Uh, it's a one of one, and uh, with a little story behind. Uh, when the uh, Oakley store in Berlin opened a couple of years ago, uh, they had an event uh, with the C100 gas cam, uh, which was uh, released on that day. Mm -hmm. And uh, they had another um, event there uh, when they opened. And um, the event was uh, they had Jupiter frames and they uh, should um, customize them. Um, they had a, a couple of uh, colors and they, they could uh, put them together, uh, customizing it. And Christian Hundertmark uh, did his own and signed it. And it was uh, through all the years in a, in a display case in the Berlin store. Uh, because it, it had, a, had a special meaning to them. And when they closed the store, um, I was able to get that pair. So it's in my collection now. And I have a, a, a couple of other things. I have a, a poster uh, signed by Jim and Colin. Um, uh, the, the poster was a, a special giveaway to all the country managers. So in, in every country, uh, there was only one of these posters for uh, saying uh, thank you and such. And I uh, get mine from, or got mine from the country manager in Germany. So it's it's also uh, only a thing uh, that, that is, there. there is only one in Germany and, and I have it. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with it. Uh, I have surely a, a couple of things here uh, like, um, not not really official releases um, like a custom cut uh, zero so that's a um, custom cut it from a, a goggle lens nice, nice. and this is something this is something more special um, this is a a fire lens, cut nice. it uh, in the in the uh, 0.3 uh, style, and the the stems are not Oakley. The stems are 3D printed nice. and nice. Uh, painted in in X metal color. So it's uh, it's like a, a pro zero. You you can't you can't fold it. <laughs> 3D printed uh, Oakley style. So. 
Um, I still uh, around with a couple of ideas and, and doing things. So maybe on another day I can show more. <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> nice. So I'm just back with those. So I'm not sure you can see. No, you can't. Well, that's uh, the, um, the logo of the Gendarmerie Nationale. And then uh, is the little uh, here. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. yeah, and it says red on the lens. Oh, okay. And the, the other one doesn't say anything because it's polarized, so they just but in polarized lens and didn't engrave anything. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that, that's the, the only two that uh, you can only find in, in France actually. And um, so that's nice. Cool. Uh, I found one more uh, that I want to show off. It was, oh yeah. Uh, yeah. So when uh, Jim joined the forum back in 2005, 2006, I forget when he, uh, he ran a contest where he was going to give away a pair of shoe ones, and then he decided to give one to me too. So he uh, signed a box of shoe ones, and I can open this without ruining it. Well, there we go. There, so it's a uh, brand new pair of mm. shoe one uh, highs. So it's the high top version. So, yeah, never been worn, never will be worn, but uh, sort of a collector's edition at this point. Yeah. Yep. So, uh, yeah, those are a couple pairs that I think I could probably spend all day showing things off, but I, I just tried to grab ones that were sort of uh, very unique. Yeah. I, I just grabbed uh, uh, another one from the, uh, from the cabinet. Um, I don't know if you can see it. Um, uh, there were, frame. That's a Mac M frame, and there were three colorways: uh, plasma and the, the dark carbide and yeah. the, the, the denim. And yeah. that is uh, from HQ, uh, one of the the test uh, frames. They were an X metal color or like raw. The, the, the dark color carbide. is called raw. So that's so probably has nice. no coating on it. So there's no coating. Really nice. And that's the problem with magnesium. My brother had, uh, he had the, the pearl one. Uh, and underneath the ear stem where it was not coated, because if you take these ear stems off, you'll notice that there's a part where it was being held before this, the spray was on it. So this part here is not protected and it, it ended up getting tumors and, and cancer. Yeah. And he says, it just looks like it went through uh, Chernobyl. <laughs> it's just, uh, <laughs> it's all unusable now. Yeah. So yeah, that's the problem with magnesium. It just as soon as it gets wet, it starts turning into different shapes. Back to Jason questions. All right, no, questions. I did the weird one. Uh, where was I? Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, do you think the? Oh yeah, <laughs> the weird ones. <laughs> weird uh, ones. Do you think that? Canadian bacon actually comes from Canadian pigs. <laughs> I don't know what to think about Canadian bacon. <laughs> I feel like it's just ham. But, uh, Is this yeah. question from Rick? <laughs> <laughs> no, that's still from Jason. Uh, from I didn't Jason know about. Canadian. Uh, I didn't yeah. know Canadian. Uh, Canadian bacon was something. That's Rick. He's oh. a, he needs a cameo yeah. on the show. <laughs> uh, yeah, so uh, I don't know. I, I like traditional bacon, but I mean, even people at Epic Meal Time in Canada, they use the real bacon. They don't use yeah. Canadian yeah. bacon. So I, I, I trust them as the, the bacon connoisseurs. Uh, I suppose if it's local pig, then it probably is a local Canadian. <laughs> okay, let, let's keep in the Canadian uh, part of the world, well, Canada. Uh, <laughs> He's doing um, ski now. Well, <laughs> and first, that, that's, a, that's a statement. Canadian maple syrup is obviously the best syrup in the world. Well, is there any <laughs> other I country? Probably maple agree, syrup? because uh, <laughs> their, their flag has the, the maple leaf on it. So assume that uh, they probably have the best uh, maple trees and probably the best maple syrup. Um, <laughs> I, I don't live... 
Oh, am I back? Yep. Yes, yes, you're okay. Yep. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, so I don't live too close to Canada, but if I ever go up north into like New Hampshire or Vermont, they, they, I, I get the real maple syrup, not the, the, the corn syrup, and it's, it's, it's a night and day difference. So I, I definitely prefer genuine, real maple syrup. So, yeah, if there's anything uh, I know in Canada wants to send me a couple boxes, I'll definitely, uh, I won't say no. Uh, and still related to that, uh, true or false? Mm -hmm. um, there was a great heist of truckloads of maple syrup stolen valued at almost 20 million Canadian bucks, but might not be so much in normal uh, bucks. <laughs> <laughs> Is it true or false? Not sure. It uh, will, will give us the answer, maybe. I'll, I'll flip a coin. Actually, let's flip a coin. I'll flip the... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we'll, we'll flip the Oakley token. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so uh, this this will be true, and then the uh, other side will be false. We'll, we'll say true. True. <laughs> true. Okay. And I guess we'll find out the answer. We'll have Jason confirm that. Okay, and uh, last one from Jason. Uh, how many times have you gone to the headquarters tour, or maybe to the headquarters? Yep, uh, so we have went, uh, my first trip was in 2005. Um, I went with um, Philip Barkett, who was uh, overview number three. He was one of the people who was there right from the start. And uh, we sort of just were celebrating our six month site anniversary. So we actually had a very nice tour then because back before they really started restricting who could go where, um, we met with uh, Jason Spencer, who brought us around. He gave us a full tour, brought us to the engine room. He even brought us into research and development, which is something no one can go into anymore. So of all the trips I've gone to since, they've never even like suggested that we could go in there. And we saw things like the, the tank or the time tank or minute machine watch before it was created. We saw the, the king face, which was never created. We saw some uh, ideas for the FUMP 2. We saw a lot of different things that just uh, some of them ended up being released, some of them not. But it was just a research and development room, so there were a lot of ideas that didn't end up happening. Um, so that was a very exciting trip. Uh, I didn't go back until 2009 when it was the co-pilot contest where we had 50 people. Oakley flew out as part of a contest, and uh, they gave us food, and we raced uh, RC cars and did paintball and things like that. So... Uh, that was 2009. I went back for 2014 for the overview 10th anniversary. Uh, I went back the following year when um, Chris Weiberg was invited me out for his 100th O-Store visit. And then we also went out for our 15th anniversary in a couple years ago, 24. Uh, I forget when. I mean, that was oh, 2019. Yeah, messing everything up. Uh, 2019, we had our... Uh, 15th anniversary so hopefully in 2024 we can uh, do a 20-year trip and try to get you know the world to come together again and see if we can make magic happen a second time and get yelled at by security <laughs> so uh yeah so 2005 2009 14 15 and 2019 five times we got a question also about that oh, sorry 2013 i went for for the red day i forgot about that yeah so six times Okay, we got a question about the 20th anniversary. Do you think they will make a, a special event or no? I don't know because Oakley is different every time I go. Uh, when we went in 2009, everyone was very, they were very forward about creating things for the fans and then it sort of phased out. But then 2014 and uh, especially 2015, they started bringing back a lot of the fan engagement. They had the collector's events and things like that, and but then that sort of uh, 2016 Luxottica sort of put a squash on a lot of things, but then when I went back in 2019, things were coming back again, so it, it's up in the air. Uh, there's a lot of turnaround. Everyone I've met at headquarters has not been there the following trip, except for a few people like uh, Brian Takumi, so it, it's, it depends who's there. depends who's able to uh, sneak us out on a tank ride if no one's looking, and I don't know. So I hope we go back. Hopefully things will line up. Hopefully there'll be some sort of cool thing we can do. But worst case, we just meet with some friends and, I don't know, go to the mall, have fun, <laughs> take pictures. 
Or, or do I some. hope we can go one day, like a trip for for our group members who are interested to go to Oakley. Yeah, definitely. Hopefully, we're allowed yeah. to travel. Walking around COVID the lobby is nice. <laughs> In five years, when COVID's over. <laughs> yes, indeed. We're allowed to travel again. Yes. Uh, there is a question from Frank Oth. He's asking about your first Oakley item that sparked your obsession. And what's the one of your first uh, off pieces in your collection? Okay, what was the last piece? I, the first pair, what was the first? Uh, spark, that was your obsession. Obsession one piece. Off. Okay. Uh, well, the first piece was the ice uh, splice. So that sort of started it all. And I believe after that it was... Uh, the minute, I think I got the X Metal 20 or the X Metal XX, and then just went from there. So the splice definitely had as my uh, sort of, you know, the special as the first one. Uh, for one that's a spark, it's hard to say because uh, it, it's probably one of the first couple other ones. Because once you get the second pair, the third pair, the fourth pair, that's when it really starts to sort of spiral. So I, I say maybe it's the... Um, You know, so maybe the 24K X Metal XX or X Metal 20. I'd say maybe this is one of the point where I started to really get more into it because this is the, I actually wore this uh, on my wedding day. So this was uh, another special pair. So at this point, it's, I really started to collect things that maybe I wasn't going to wear every day because this one's a, it's a difficult one to wear. It's, it's, it's not flexible in the winter. It gets kind of cold. So it's, it's also one I want to keep in, you know, relatively good condition too. So I say, uh, yeah, first pair splice, and then uh, the spark pair is going to be this one that really got me to just start collecting like crazy. That that's quite bling for waiting. Hey, yeah, <laughs> you got you got to be loud. <laughs> Um, I think the next question, you, you already answered that in, uh, in the first questions, uh, that was from uh, Alex Betts, and I'd like to know what started his interest and got him into Oakley's. So I, I think you already talked about that. So maybe I'll, I'll take a question from the Facebook chat. Sure. Uh, Fred, again. Fred Baker, thank you. Uh, quick question, Dan, do you think that the initial ID for the coffee table book was done by Oakley later? Yeah, dear. Um, I'm not sure because we had originally decided to do like a fan coffee table book and I actually created a separate site where people could add images, add information. We were going to try to do like a, almost a, a crowdsourced information one. Um, the only thing people submitted was just some random photos. So that didn't really last. So um, I don't know. I mean, I think what happened was around that time, uh, they were in one of their swings where they're really sort of engaging with the fans and being proud of their history. So I think it probably just happened naturally. Uh, it was probably also related to the fact that there were so many people who are collectors and fans and things like that. So I think it's probably just this organic conclusion of the fans interacting with Oakley and, uh, you know, just sort of making something happen. So uh, I do have one of the books somewhere. I don't know. It's it's probably up on the shelf. I I haven't gone through it too much. I did sort of pan through it when I was at headquarters last time, um, but I did. Yeah, I guess that's. I have a a, a third question from Paul Jewis. Mm -hmm. uh, what do you class as the most irreplaceable piece in your collection? It's a hard one to answer. Now. I've been trying to think of what I would choose because. There's a lot of things that just are irreplaceable. Um, really, the only things that aren't irreplaceable are the ones that I can just go out and grab in a store now. So, like if something, let's say my daily one got scratched or broken, I mean, it would be annoying to go back to the store and buy a new one just because it'd be another few hundred dollars, but I could do it. Whereas most of the either the one offs or the vintage pairs are the ones that are very fragile. I, I, it's probably a cop out, but I'd say like oh, pretty much almost anything in my collection is going to be almost near irreplaceable at this point, just because either things aren't around anymore, you can't find them, or they're just so prohibitively expensive at this point that it's uh, gonna be difficult. Um, I say probably maybe one of them is... Uh, 
this one right here. And this one is something that probably doesn't look too out of the ordinary. So this is actually a very special one. This is the square wire 30 millimeter. Due to regulations in Australia, no pair of glasses can be smaller in width than 30 millimeters from top to bottom. So that's why the penny was actually not allowed to be sold in Australia because the lens was too short. So the square wire 30 millimeter, they made a special one that is just big enough that it gets to 30 millimeters and is allowed for sale. And this one was ridiculously hard to find. So part of my goal is to have every model from 1975, starting with the grips up to 2005. And 2005 is my cutoff just because that's when I decided to do that. So it's been 15 years now that I've been trying to collect my initial list. So um, things like this are just going to be those really difficult ones to get uh, just because they were just so obscure and there this is from another country. So I say, yeah, things like that, which have taken me years to find will probably be the hardest ones, but almost everything in my collection is going to be a major pain to try to replace if I had to. Of course. Thanks. Um, and I think that one also got Professor, covered. Kind from, of. John, from John Yomir? Yeah. Sorry? Okay. You are, now the question from John Whitwell also it was answered. So yeah. it is how it's possible to help or review website. Yeah, website help or help us. Yeah, so I mean, if, if we want to have help, I'm going to definitely going to work with the, the group to try to you know, target pieces of information that people can help out with and slowly build things over time. So I'll, after this, I'm going to keep being active in the group and trying to uh, you know, display information I've already discovered and then also maybe try to solicit uh, further help from people because we can all join together and try to get some more information captured. Okay, um, I have another question from uh, Riyad Ramon Tuvales Maturan. Uh, what is your favorite pair? I think you, you said that about the splice maybe. Uh, what is your favorite pair and what is your rarest item on hand? Yeah, so uh, I mean, I always say splice is my favorite just because it's my first, um, but I, I'd have to say probably maybe if it was for one that I was going to wear every day, I'd say probably that the half jacket or the flat jacket, just because as far as wearing one every day, they're the most comfortable. I like ones that don't have a bottom frame. Um, so my half jackets, my flat jackets, and then I'm, actually I'm using a mercenary now. Those are all the ones that I probably like the most if I'm going to be wearing it every day. Because obviously there's ones you collect and then there's ones you wear, and usually they don't mix too much. So I'd say... Yeah, so instead of the splice, which is sort of my first one, I'd say probably either the half jacket or the flak jacket would be my favorite uh, daily pair. Uh, as far as rarest ones, uh, there's one more I gotta show you. <laughs> so uh, people know about the Flying Tiger gas can. Yeah. Well, this is actually a Flying Tiger hijinks. And I actually have a Flying Tiger oil drum, which is buried in there too. So this is a hand-painted one by uh, Brian Takumi. So what he did is when he was designing the color scheme for the Flying Tiger models, he just used a bigger frame to sort of show it off. And then when it went to the final release, they scaled it down to the uh, gas cans. So he's, um, I believe you can see it, he did sign it and he signed the other one as well. So this one I'm actually just holding for someone. There's three in existence. There's uh, one oil rig. And then there's two of the hijinks. So the person who had the hijinks, he sent it to me. Um, if for some reason I don't collect Oakley anymore, I'll, I'll definitely send it back to him. But for now, I'm holding on to two out of the three prototypes for the Flying Tigers at the moment. Ooh. Actually, wasn't, wasn't one of those given away during the a quiz question at the headquarters? Yeah, yeah. So uh, that was actually during co-pilot. So they had three they were going to give out. Um, the first one, that one was given away right. to someone who uh, donated a flag. Um, then throughout the day, they were going to do trivia and give out one. But then uh, I think it was Scott Bowers. He, he said, uh, let's do one right now. So he said, what are the first 
five uh, Oakley models that were released in order. Um, I had already won something at the time, so you're only allowed to win uh, one contest prize. But no one answered, so I said, hey, I, I don't want the prize, but I can probably answer anyway. So I started rattling off, you know, frog skin blade, razor blade, slit, and frame. Uh, and I went, I think I did like eight or so. And he just laughed and he just threw it at me. So that's how I got that pair. Um, and then a third one got released uh, or given away later in the day. So that one's floating around. I think I know who has it, but I don't want to have people asking him to sell it. So I'll leave that up private. The last questions are from Peter, Peter Yi. Yes. So Peter is asking, do you still have the same passion for Oakley today that you had when your site first got popular with other like-minded people? Yeah, I, I think so. I mean, I mean, here we are, we're, we're, we're meeting with some old friends and new friends, and we're still talking about this just like I did back in 2002. So, um, I mean, obviously, when you first start collecting, there's a, there's a great excitement. You usually you go out and you start getting everything you want. Uh, and then over time, that's not sustainable. So you end up just sort of slowing down, getting things here and there. Uh, but, you know, here we are. I still log in every day, still talk to people, still hunt for new information, still get excited about the new releases. Um, every once in a while, it, like, it seems like some of the modern releases aren't really too exciting, but then they'll come out with something crazy that you really end up liking. So it's, it's a slow. It's slow. It's sustainable. So, yeah, maybe it's not fevered, but it's definitely something that just keeps you on it for the long haul. So I can imagine another 10 years, I'll still be in the same position where we're just collecting more and I'll have to find some more shelf space because I'm running out of room. <laughs> Another no. question from Peter. What do you wish Oakley still did or had today? What do you wish they didn't do? I wish they would have a cut your own lens program where you could not have to go to third party lens people to get replacements for your x uh, This was one of the point of contentions during the, the 2014 meet where we, we talked with uh, Peter. And uh, they claimed that you know, X metals weren't meant to be something that was lasting forever. But I remember a video where he said X metals is a piece of jewelry that you're going to have for your entire life. So I, I felt bad about kind of calling them out then. But you know, people have X metals. It's a titanium frame. It's something that is is durable. It's going to withstand a lot of abuse. But if the lens gets scratched, now the the whole pair is not usable anymore. So I would love to not have to go to a third party lens person to get. Um, you know, lenses that aren't going to be the quality that Oakley makes. I'd love for them to just be able to say, you know, for maybe even an extra $20, like, you know, instead of a, a $60 lens, you pay $80, but you get something that exactly fits an old model. So if you had an old pair of eye jackets or, you know, an old, old anything, it'd be really cool if they could just have the entire range of all the lenses they've ever produced and be able to have sort of like a, a cut to order, almost like the, the Oakley Custom Program. So that would be something I'd love to have, just so that way, if you do wear an old pair and it does get scratched, you can still sort of resurrect it without buying a whole brand new pair. Unless it's a zero, then it's like the whole frame is a lens, and that's kind of silly. But I'd like to, uh, you know, minimally the X-Metals, because that's that's really where people are always trying to find replacements. And half jackets. Bring back the half jacket lens, because I got a lot of frames. <laughs> um, what did I wish they didn't do? I'd say probably the collector's editions, and I know it's probably not a popular one, but I, I like to be able to have a fair shot at collecting or buying anything that they release. So when it's something's like one of a hundred, it's like I'll probably never get a chance to even find that. And if I do, it's going to be on eBay for three times the price. So I'd rather pay Oakley for something than to pay someone on eBay for something. So I guess that would be my answer. Just uh, you know, make, make things accessible. Make give us the ability to get everything the first time and not have to go back to third party resellers. The third question is, are you missing anything major from your own collection? So going back to my list. So I, I want to collect everything from up to 2005. And I believe that was like 119 models from 1975. And that's including the grips. I'm just including those just for the early parts. Uh, but then starting with the frog skins and going up until like the gas can. Uh, so I think it's 119 models and I think I'm missing like 14. And most of them are things that aren't terribly rare anymore. So, you know, stuff like the, the 
square wire 30 millimeter. Um, actually, Francois helped me with the Mag M frame. That was a big help. So a lot of those hard ones are ones that I've sort of knocked off now. The only thing left are things that really aren't that uncommon. So stuff like bottle cap, iWire 3, E-wire 3.1, 2.1. Uh, a lot of things that just aren't really rare. I just haven't gotten a chance to get it. So yeah, so at this point, anything I'm outstanding is something that I just have to get around and find at this point. So uh, my, my goal is to try to complete that 1975 to 2005 list and just have one of every model and hopefully do a video about that when I complete it. Amazing. Guys, do you have any questions to add? Uh, there's another question uh, from the chat, uh, from the from the Facebook. Uh, that, uh, how often do you guys clean the displays uh, or the eyewear? Not often enough. I, I should probably do that <laughs> at some point. I just, I get it's it takes so long. Uh, yeah. Actually, if you if you want, I'll, I'll unplug my laptop quickly. Let me just put these away. I'll, I'll... I'll give you a quick uh, tour of everything. So down here is my sort of artist series and special editions. Here I have the frames that are more uh, like animal prints. These are the points. Here is the zero, and then here is. And then what I did recently was put out of space. I have to build half shells to fit twice as many. We can't hear you well. Oh, I'm sorry. So I fit um I created some half shells so I can fit twice as many glasses in here. No, we can't <laughs> hear you. Okay, so hand maybe on the on the mic uh hold Yeah, something. I'm probably in the wrong area. But basically um I, I sort of this this one here. Yeah. So this one is uh, I've created half shelves and I can fit twice as many glasses in there. So I have like I don't even know how many are in there, but uh, it, it's just a pain to try to reach in and take everything out. So I just try to keep everything shut most of the time. It keeps most of the best out. I probably should do a good clean sooner than later, but yeah, it's not often enough. Same here. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm not even cleaning anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Next time you move, you clean. That's that's my. Yeah, hopefully yeah. not. <laughs> hopefully, yeah, same here. Hopefully, I don't. I don't want to move any of this. This is. I did it once. Yep. It, it too much. I'll just stay here. I, I'd, ra I'd rather get rid of it before than than yeah. moving it. <laughs> Especially the cases. Yeah. So All I right. think these are uh, these were the questions for today. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Francois and Thomas, also for helping us tonight. Uh, it was a real pleasure to meet you all. And uh, if someone has a question, he can put in the chat. And later on, when Dan has a, has some time, he will answer them also. Yeah, I'll definitely be monitoring this so I can uh, head back and answer anything that has been missed. Would you like to add something? I just want to, again, thank everyone who has been a part for the last uh, 17 years as well as the people that still take part today. So whether it's you know, on the site itself or on the Facebook groups or Instagram or wherever people are, or even in person, I just wanna thank everyone for helping me out and uh, being appreciative of the little thing I've tried to do and then what people do to, to help back. So uh, met a lot of great friends, still continue to do so today. And I'm, I'm happy that a lot of them have also you know, stayed in there for, for so many years. I think I've had people I've been friends with longer online than in real life. So it's been something that wouldn't have been possible otherwise. So again, just thank you, everyone. Thank you. Francois, you would like to say something? Not much, no. Just uh, again, uh, thank you, Dan, for, uh, well, for, for a review, obviously, uh, and uh, how you you manage it in a, in a really nice way. Um, friendly way and consistent way that that's just a very nice community that you built thank you and i'm proud Thomas. to have this shirt <laughs> <laughs> all over the world 
Uh, also, uh, thank you from my side. Um, it was very interesting uh, to get an, a, a little insight in, in the O review beginning and uh, in, in, uh, in your collection and in your uh, knowledge. Uh, we should uh, do more things like this. Um, it's Definitely. it's very interesting, and um, I'm I'm happy to be part of this um, um, of this worldwide fan group. Um, Maya, you do a very good job as an administrator, uh, very well. And Thank you. yeah, I'm. I would love to uh, meet you all uh, one day in in person. Maybe in the United States. Maybe at HQ. Maybe in uh, in Milano, um, where the new HQ is. <laughs> um, let's stay in contact. And uh, yeah, okay. cool, cool thing. Yeah. Thanks. Very cool. Amazing. Thank you and have a good night. Yeah. And have good a good night. day, Dan. It's uh, still the morning there. Yeah, Sorry. I still have a whole day ahead of me. <laughs> yes, yes. Have a good day, Dan. I'm going to have lunch now. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Bye bye. 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 Oh, it looks Switzerland. It's very nice. Black I need to visit there. I will visit someday too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you. Bye bye. See you. Bye bye.